Digital information is very easy to copy. It can easily be broken down into packets and put back together again without losing any data. Vint Cerf is an engineer who has written some of the most important software for today's internet. He said that digital packets are just like postcards. The best way to describe packet switching technology is to remind you that packets are just like postcards. They've got to and from addresses on them, and they've got a limited amount of content. And, like a postcard, you put them in the post box. If you put two in, you do not know what order they're going to come out in. They might not even come out on the same day. They do not necessarily follow the same paths to get to the destination. The only difference is that an electronic packet goes about a hundred million times faster than a postcard. Now Larry Roberts had plans for the hardware and the software of the ARPANET. The next question was, who could build it? This was exactly what Larry Roberts asked Wes Clark when Clark gave him the idea for a network of imps. There's only one person in America who can build your network, replied Wes Clark, Frank Hart. Larry Roberts knew Frank Hart. They had worked together at Lincoln Laboratory. Hart was an expert in real-time systems. Systems that work so quickly that human beings do not notice any delay at all. The ARPANET did not need to be so fast, but to make packet switching work, lots of very complicated problems of timing would have to be solved. Frank Hart's skills seemed to make him the best man for the job. He was also known as someone who always finished what he started. But Larry Roberts could not simply hire him. Contracts like the ARPANET were supposed to be offered to many competitors, so the government got the best deal. Roberts had to ask for bids from the best companies in the computer and communications industries. In August 1968, he wrote a plan and sent it to 140 technology companies. It can't be done, replied most of them. The biggest names in the computer business at the time were sure that the network could not be built. Both IBM, International Business Machines, and Control Data Corporation said the job was impossible. They said no one could build the network for an acceptable price, because the imps would have to be enormously expensive mainframe computers. The telephone companies were even more negative. AT&T controlled long-distance phone calls in the USA. You'll never make packet switching work, it said. The telephone companies had never been helpful to computer scientists. Please give us good data communications, the scientists asked. We have phone lines everywhere. Use the telephone network, said the telephone companies. But you don't understand said the scientists. It takes 25 seconds to arrange a call. You charge us for at least three minutes, and we only want to send less than a second of data. Go away, the telephone companies replied. We earn tiny sums from data compared to the money that we make from voice traffic. So the computer scientists went away, and they created the Internet. One of the companies that bid to build the ARPANET was Bolt, Berenick & Newman, BBN of Cambridge, Massachusetts. BBN was the place where Frank Hart worked, and half the staff had already worked with Larry Roberts at Lincoln Laboratory. Frank Hart gave ARPA's plan to his best programmer, Severo Ornstein. Hart said, why don't you take this home and have a look at it and see what you think? Ornstein came back the next day and said, Well, sure, we could build that if you wanted to, but I can't see why anyone would want it. Ornstein did see a problem, though. BBN's a small company, so we'll have to put in a very, very good bid to win the contract. Of course, said Frank Hart, but what's the problem? We are very, very good, aren't we? Yes, Ornstein agreed, 
But isn't it a big problem that so many of us know Larry Roberts? He won't want to be seen passing out contracts to his old friends. Frank Hart did not agree. If the bid is good enough, we'll win, he said. Frank Hart believed that a small company had an advantage in this situation. Unlike IBM or AT&T, BBN could move very quickly. For four weeks, Hart and his team worked day and night. Later, some members of the team honestly believed that the work had taken six months, not one. By the time they had finished, their plan was enormously detailed. They had worked out most of the design for the imps using an existing computer from the Honeywell company. They described how the network could be made to work even under heavy loads, and they also discovered that they could make the system run ten times more quickly than ARPA was asking. In the end, BBN had only one serious competitor for the ARPANET contract, the much bigger Raytheon Corporation. But the difference in size persuaded Larry Roberts to choose BBN. Why BBN and not Raytheon? Bob Taylor asked him. BBN's bid is very good. It's as good as Raytheon's. I agree, said Bob Taylor, but why pick BBN and not Raytheon? Raytheon is bigger. But that's just the problem, Roberts replied. There are too many layers of managers at Raytheon. If something goes wrong, who do I call? At BBN, everyone reports to Frank Hart. If there's a problem, I can just phone Frank and tell him to fix it. BBN is a small company. Don't worry, that will make them fast. Larry Roberts gave the contract to BBN, but the company would need to be fast. It only had nine months to complete the job. Frank Hart's team started work at the beginning of 1969, and the job had to be finished by the 1st of September. No one today knows why BBN was given so little time to build the ARPANET. There probably isn't a reason, Frank Hart said to his team. The government sometimes picks dates without thinking. This one is probably an artificial date picked by the government and picked by Larry Roberts. I don't know why they chose it. I can't see any reason why it has to be that particular day. But that's what it is. That is in the contract, and so that's what we've got to do. They had several big jobs to do. The team had to make packet switching work in the real world. They had to turn an ordinary computer into an imp. They had to write software to control the imps, and they had to work with the four host sites to make sure that the imps could communicate with their mainframes. The biggest problem was the hardware. I'm worried that we won't get the hardware built in time, said Frank Hart. We've done this kind of thing before, said Severo Ornstein. Yes, but there's so much more to do this time, said Hart. We have to design a computer. We have to get Honeywell to understand the design and build it. Then we need to test it. The imps were the heart of the network. Each imp would stand between a host computer and the telephone system. It would have to translate messages from the host computer into packets for the network. When it received packets, it would have to know whether to build them into a message for its host or pass them on to another imp. At any moment, all of the imps would have to know how the whole network was performing so they could send packets by the most efficient route. Because the imps were so important, Frank Hart wanted to make sure that they would never break down. He also wanted them to be impossible to destroy. He imagined students at the host sites opening the imps and taking them apart. He tried very hard to make sure that this could not happen. Frank Hart's worries about students were one of the main reasons that he decided to base the imps on Honeywell's DDP-516 computer. 
Honeywell sold this computer to the army. Frank Hart knew that the company had an interesting way of proving that the machine was strong enough to work in a war. So, how do you prove that a computer will not break? To answer this question, Honeywell invited its customers into a large hall. There, a DDP-516 was hanging from the ceiling. That's interesting, the customer might say, but what does that tell us? Look more closely, the Honeywell people said. When the customer approached, he saw that the computer was actually working while it was swinging on a rope above the ground. That's very good. Oh no, said the Honeywell people, not really. But the next thing you'll see is certainly very, very good. At that moment, a tall, strong man walked into the room carrying a large hammer. He swung the hammer, and with a great crash, he hit the computer again, and again, and again. When the computer had stopped swinging, the Honeywell people invited the customer to inspect it again. Check and see if it's working now they said. It always was. This was almost enough to calm Frank Hart's fears about students. The software for imps needed to be at least as good as the hardware. The software had to deliver whole messages to the correct destinations. For this, software had to be written that worked even if the hardware didn't even if an evil student had managed to break one of Frank Hart's imps. This is still the way the Internet works today. The software understands how to avoid broken hardware. If a packet does not reach its destination, the software knows. Then it sends that packet again, by a different route if necessary. In the spring of 1969, both the software and the hardware were working in BBN's own building. Now we know the network will work, said Severo Ornstein. Don't forget the messages are only travelling a few metres, Frank Hart warned. That isn't a network. We still have to build a system that works over thousands of kilometres. That's true, Ornstein agreed. But we know that the principle is exactly the same if the wire is a metre long or a hundred kilometres long. The phone company says that the length of the wire doesn't matter. It's going to work. I hope you're right, said Hart. At the four host sites, the teams had even less time to build their parts of the network, and some of the team members had no experience of this kind of work. Vint Cerf was one of them. Every day, he thought, when are the professional managers going to arrive? We're just graduate students. But there never were any professional managers, so Surf and his friends just continued to do the work. At each host site, the computer was a mainframe, a machine that was designed to behave like the only computer in the universe. In each case, this computer had to be connected to another computer, an imp, for the first time. But each mainframe was different and needed a different set of connections. The question is, exactly how do they connect? said Frank Hart. How do they connect electrically? How do they connect logically? How does the software connect? These are very difficult questions, and they have to be solved very, very, very quickly because we at BBN have to build special hardware into the Honeywell machine at our end of the connection, and all the host sites have to build special hardware for their mainframe computers and write special software to match our connection. ARPA was very clear about the network it wanted. One host computer connected to one IMP, but the host sites all had more than one big computer. Soon they were calling Frank Hart. Wait, wait, they said. We've got more than one computer. We want to connect two or three computers to your imp, please. Hart was surprised. Why are you suddenly so keen on the network? he asked. Only a few months ago you were all saying, leave us alone. 
Well, yes, that's true, said the people at the host sites. But now we can see how useful the network will be. To share data with other sites? Not really. What then? Frank Hart wanted to know. Well, even here, just at this university, the computers can't talk to each other, said the host sites. They're all made by different companies and they all use different software. But your imp is designed to connect different machines together. If you let us connect all our computers to the imp, then we'll be able to share data here much more easily. So, you want me to build you a local network? Yes, please. On July the 16th, 1969, Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon. But at BBN, there was not much time to watch the historic television broadcast. It was just six weeks before the first imp was due to be delivered to the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA. BBN heard that UCLA was not ready. UCLA believed that BBN was going to be late. Both teams were working 24 hours a day. At BBN, Frank Hart was worried about transporting the imp from Cambridge to Los Angeles. This was not simple in 1969, says Severo Ornstein. The ability to move a machine across the country was important. Today, you carry machines around and you expect to switch them on and you just expect it all to work. But just a few years ago, computers were built into walls, and if you shook the room a little bit, it was days before you could make the machine work again. Frank Hart decided that the imp should go to Los Angeles by air. Truett Thatch met it at Los Angeles airport, and he was shocked to see that the box was the wrong way up. Somewhere along the way, the imp had been turned over an odd number of times. He made sure it was turned over again, and went with it to the UCLA. It was the Saturday before the Labor Day holiday, and there were very few people at the university. But the whole UCLA network team was waiting outside the building. Vince Cerf had brought an expensive bottle of wine. It was immediately obvious that the box was too big to fit through the door. They had to take the imp out of the box on the street. Everyone at UCLA was surprised by the size and weight of the imp. It was about the size of a fridge, and it weighed nearly 500 kilograms. The team had been thinking about almost nothing apart from the imp for nine months, but it was still a shock to actually see it. Steve Crocker was part of the UCLA team. It's a little like seeing your parents invite to dinner someone that you've never met. You don't pay much attention until you discover that they actually want you to marry this strange person. It took a few minutes to connect the imp to the host computer. Then it was switched on. It began to run its software at exactly the same point where it had stopped back at BBN. Within an hour, the imp and the host were exchanging information. The UCLA imp and its host were the only machines on the network. Until another host computer was connected, the ARPANET would not be a real network. One month later, on the 1st of October 1969, the second imp was delivered to the Stanford Research Institute. The telephone lines were connected to both imps. Each imp was connected to its host. Everything was turned on, and the network was ready for its first message. Vint Cerf was at UCLA. First, he tried to log on to the host computer at Stanford. This means typing in some instructions that obtain permission to run programs on a computer. A computer scientist like Cerf usually logged onto computers many times a day, but no one had ever logged on to another computer over a network before. As he typed at the keyboard, he also had a voice connection to the other engineer at Stanford. Cerf typed an L and spoke into the telephone. Did you get the L? he asked. I got the L, said the other engineer. Cerf typed an O. 
What about that? he asked. Did you get an O? I got an O. So Surf typed a G to complete the first word ever sent over a network. Did you get the G? he asked. Uh, no, no G. The network had crashed. No problem, said Vint Surf. You got the L and the O, say them together. L-O, sounds like hello, doesn't it? It only took a few more hours until the network worked properly. The first message was not important, but the event was. Despite all the theory and the tests which proved that the ARPANET should work, the connection between UCLA and Stanford proved that the network did work. It was the first time that distant computers had ever talked to each other. The ARPANET was the first computer network. Soon it would become the heart of a network of networks. The Internet.